Last week we hit you with loads of news about the upcoming Intel 12th Gen processors and also Gigabyte motherboards, Zeus motherboards and MSI motherboards including this very MSI Meg Z690 Unify. Today is the launch of the CPUs which means we can tell you all about performance. KitGuru has already covered the new Core i9-12900K and now it's the turn of the Core i5-12600K which is strapped to the test bench and ready to go. In our Core i9 video, I covered our test procedures, the reasons why we chose the hardware that we're using today. I shan't recap all that. It's about eight minutes of that video. Let's give you the 20 second overview, which is the test bench consists of MSI Meg Z690 Unify, Corsair Vengeance DDR5 32 gigabytes 5200 mega transfer, Sabrent Rocket PCI Express Gen 4 SSD with Fizon controller, Core i5 12600K obviously, Corsair H150i Elite LCD cooler, Seasonic Prime Titanium 850 watt power supply, and RTX 3080 graphics. We're ready to get testing. When you start up your system with a high-end MSI motherboard, you're typically faced with this screen, uh, which doesn't make a lot of sense. So boxed cooler, which implies a small air cooler, power limit 241 watts, that's the standard Intel profile. Tower air cooler, power limit 288 watts. Show me this tower air cooler that can handle that. Water cooler, 4096 watts. Well, we have a water cooler, but that's a lot. Okay, so we're doing that, and then let's have a quick look around the BIOS to show you what is going on. So we enable XMP, we only have the one profile at the moment with this Corsair memory. No doubt in future we'll have more uh, settings, not very interesting. Here we go, OC settings. So if we look down, we see that we have advanced CPU configuration. Active P cores, performance cores, we've got six. We can disable, therefore, up to five. Active E cores, up to four. So it's six plus four. It's a 16 thread processor, as we can see on the easy screen. So 6P, 4E, they have hyper threading, those do not. And let's take a quick look at Blender so we can see how this 10 core, 16 thread budget processor behaves. So out of the box, we've got 4.5 gigahertz for the P cores, 3.4 gigahertz for the E cores. Package temperatures low 50s at the moment and power is 110 watts. It's a pussycat by Intel standards. Of course, in AMD terms, that's quite proper and beefy but we've got plenty of cores pounding away at decent speeds, faster than AMD can muster, 110 watts and temperature mid 50s. Intel Extreme Tuning Utility or XTU version 7.5.3.3. We have system information about the Core i5-12600K. We have a basic tuning option here. We do not have their speed optimizer auto overclocking. That feature is only available at the moment for Core i9-KKF. Apparently version 7.6 of this software when it comes will support more processors. Don't know if that includes the Core i5. So we can do all sorts of overclocking manually, but we can't simply click a button and go for it. However, we can, if we choose, bump up the performance cores to 50 times, so 5 gigahertz, and the efficient cores, we could take those to uh, 4 gigahertz, and we could apply. And given that we're only running at 110 watts, we've got loads of headroom, and then we can run a benchmark, and we can see what happens. And that was indeed all that was required to raise the clock speed from 4.5 gigahertz to 5 gigahertz. I can barely believe it, particularly as Macore i9 testing didn't go half as well. Overclocking that processor bumped up temperatures immediately to 100 Celsius under load. Uh, when I get the next motherboard up, I'm certainly going to try some manual overclocking with that Core i9. But the Core i5, perhaps it's just this Core i5, the overclocking was really easy. So 
So now let's dive into our performance charts and tell you how it performed. Starting with 7-zip compressing. The Core i5-12600K is in the middle of the table, just behind the Ryzen 7 5800, surprisingly just behind the Core i9-10900KF, and above the old Core i7-11700, Core i7-10700, and way ahead of the Ryzen 5. It's a similar story in 7-zip decompressing, however the overclocked and stock figures for the new Core i5 sit either side of the Ryzen 5 5600X. In BAPCO Crossmark, looking at the overall scores, the Core i5 beats its older cousins comfortably. And then we move on to Blender. This is the test that tells us everything we need to know, and the Core i5-12600K beats Ryzen 7. Forget about the old Core i5s. This is going well. Cinebench R23 Multi, same story. The new Core i5 is sitting in the middle of the table and running like a champ. Single threaded performance in Cinebench R23. This is looking impressive. In Handbrake, running an H.264 conversion, the new Core i5 demolishes the old Core i5s and also Ryzen 5 and Ryzen 7. Handbrake H.265, again, same story. We're taking the fight here to old Core i9s. 3D Mark times by just the CPU score. Look how high up the chart this Core i5 is climbing. This is looking indecent. And then we move on to games. So we start with Deus Ex, which is an old game, and at 1080, the Core i5 is performing astonishingly well. 1440p, there's nothing to choose in the frame rates, so it's reasonably high up the chart, but it's on par with pretty much every other processor in the group. However, the old processors are way down the bottom now. Far Cry New Dawn, 1080. The new Core i5s, they're up high in the charts. Far Cry New Dawn at 1440. The overclocked Core i5 is flying along. And then we come right up to date. Far Cry 6 at 1080. This is almost unbelievable. This is a budget processor that is outperforming two thirds of the field. And it's the same story in Far Cry 6 at 1440. The new Core i5 is an absolute gem. Watch Dogs Legion at 1080. Again, the new Core i5 is in the upper third of the chart. When we go to Watch Dogs Legion at 1440, a very few FPS covers the entire field. So the auto Core i5 is down low, the overclocked is up high, but you're only talking about two FPS difference. ADA 64 memory bandwidth. The processors at the top with the enormous amount of bandwidth are running DDR5. So in the DDR5 processors, i.e. the brand new Alder Lake processors, the Core i5 sits below Core i7 and Core i9. However, it demolishes the old Ryzen's and also the previous generations of Intel processors. In ADA64 memory latency, we flip the position around. The new processors on DDR5 have appalling latency. And then we do some analysis. So Cinebench R23, how many points do you get per pound? And the answer is many. It's a cheap processor that has good performance and it's at the top of the chart. Cinebench R23, how many points do you get per watt of power at the wall socket? The answer is a lot. Ryzen 9 is incredibly efficient, but the new Core i5, it's doing well. Power consumption at the wall socket. So the stock system running on auto, 225 watts at the wall socket, overclock it, 315. That's an extra 90 watts for 500 megahertz. You can see that Intel had left this processor running at a very efficient setting. The extra performance is easily taken off the table. However, you have to pay for it in power. And it's the same story in temperatures. So on auto, a mere 61 Celsius, albeit with this huge Corsair cooler. Overclock it, and now we're looking at 86 degrees Celsius, which is perfectly acceptable, but it's considerably hotter than the auto settings. If you weren't as impressed as I was by the performance of this new Core i5, then honestly, I don't know what to say. Blown away. So my pros and cons for this processor. Pros, the good points. Top gaming performance at a sensible price. We can argue about sensible price, but these days 300 pounds is sensible. 
The combination of 6p cores plus 4e cores beats Ryzen 5 Hollow. In essence, it's 6 against 6, except these are 6 faster cores than AMD's got, plus you've got some extra cores. It's not a fair fight. I'm calling this processor excellent value for money. It makes you wonder why you should spend more than this unless you're doing serious hardcore video conversion work or some such. But for gaming duties, this processor, it pretty much does it all. It runs nice and cool under load. Okay, this is a tricky area. So obviously I'm talking about when you're running on auto mode rather than when you overclock. For one thing, the difference in temperatures there is significant. And for another thing, it depends on the cooler you strap on. This is a substantial cooler that's very effective. If you run on auto, you clearly do not need a 360 AIO. On the other hand, if you're running overclocked, you need a 280 or a 360 or a really big air cooler. So it depends, but nonetheless, this processor can be cooled without any difficulty whatsoever. And the overclocking, the 500 megahertz, just by moving some sliders, I don't know how lucky I've got in the silicon lottery of this one. Uh, perhaps I'm, I'm uniquely blessed. Perhaps they all do this. I don't know. I've got a sample of one, but moving those sliders in Intel software, it was just outrageously simple. And the return was easy to see as to how far you want to go along that line, trading off power and heat for performance. That obviously is a personal choice, but XTU was just a pussycat with this processor. The cons. Only two, but they're, they're reasonably large cons. The first is obviously you need to buy into Intel's 12th gen, Alder Lake, the 600 series of motherboards, which is clearly a whole new type of uh, hardware. And at the moment that means Z690. So you could buy a cheapish Z690 board, but it's not gonna be cheap. You might decide to go for one of the DDR4 models. You haven't got to buy some expensive DDR5 memory, and I'd understand that, uh, but the processor is only part of the package. Uh, if you don't currently have a PCI Express Gen 4 SSD, you might be considering upgrading your SSDs at the same time. You could be spending a lot of money, in which case you might think, ah, 300 pounds versus 400 for Core i7, or indeed a Ryzen 7, or uh, 600 pounds for the Core i9, stepping up to Ryzen 9 if you're going down the other route. It might be the price of the processor becomes slightly immaterial when you look at the overall cost. And again, that's something you have to bear in mind. It might be you think this processor is the one for you and when the budget chipsets sub Z690 come out, then you're plump for this processor. That may very well be the way to go. It depends when those other chipsets and motherboards come out. And then finally, the power. This processor is using about 40 watts more than the comparable Ryzen 5. Uh, Intel has caught up significantly in terms of efficiency with AMD and TSMC, but they're not there yet. On the other hand, they are stomping the Ryzen 5 in performance and you're using more power to do that. So it's a trade-off. Impressive, but it's not for free. Nonetheless, to my mind, this is a must-have. It's a 9 out of 10. You can toss up whether you want the Ryzen 5 or the Core i5. They each have their merits, but this processor, it's blooming impressive. Thank you.